Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered together again. This is the second of the second month, and it is also the 16th of the fourth month on the Gregorian calendar. We're continuing with our reading and study of the recognitions of Clement. We're currently, I believe this is book five, I'm sorry, but it's chapter six. We read a little bit of this last week, but we're going to start right here for continuity. And this is titled, Y'all Who Will It To Be Loved More Than Parents? So then let us consider carefully in the next place <clears throat> what reason we have for loving our parents. For this cause, it is said, we love them because they seem to be the authors of our life. But our parents are not the authors of our life, but the means of it. For they do not bestow life but afford our, the means of our entering into this life, while the one and sole author of life is Yahuwah. If therefore we would love the author of our life, let us know that it is he that is to be loved. But then it is said, <clears throat> we cannot know him, but them we know and hold in affection. Be it so, you cannot know what Elohim is, but you can very easily know what Elohim is not. For how can any man fail to know that wood or stone or brass or other such matter is not Elohim? But if you will not give your mind to consider the things that you might easily apprehend, it is certain that you are hindered in the knowledge of Elohim, not by impossibility, but by indolence. For if you had desired it, even from these useless images, you might have been set on the way of comprehension. For it is certain that these images were made with iron tools. But iron is wrought by fire, which fire is extinguished by water. But water is moved by ruach. And ruach has its beginning from Yahuwah. For thus says the foreteller Moshe, in the beginning Elohim made the skies or the, the Shemayim and the earth, and the earth was invisible and unarranged, and darkness was over the deep. And the Ruach of Elohim was upon the waters, which Ruach, like the Creator's hand, by command of Elohim, separated separated light from darkness, and after that invisible sky produced this visible one, that he might make the higher places a habitation for Malachim, or messengers, and the lower for men. For your sake, therefore, by command of Elohim, the water that was upon the face of the earth withdrew, that the earth might produce fruits for you. And into the earth also he insert, inserted veins of moisture, that fountains and rivers might flow forth from it for you. For your sake it was commanded to bring forth living creatures and all things that could serve for your use and pleasure. Is it not for you that the winds blow, that the earth conceiving by them may bring forth fruits? Is it not for you that the showers fall and the seasons change? Is it not for you that the sun rises and sets and the moon undergoes her changes? For you, the sea offers its service that all things may be subject to you, ungrateful as you are. For all these things, will there not be a righteous punishment of vengeance? Because beyond all else, you are ignorant of the bestower of all these things, whom you ought to acknowledge and reverence above all. But now I lead you to comprehending by the same paths. For you see that all things are produced from waters. And this is something that you can also find <clears throat> in 4th Ezra, 
when he's reciting how creation was done. And also, I believe in second Baruch, the creatures and the things came forth out of the waters when he had made them. But this is where the life comes from the waters. And this is the illusion that he's talking about here. But it says, but water was made at first by the only begotten and the almighty Elohim is the head of the only begotten by whom we come to the father in such order as we have stated above but when you have come to the father you will learn that this is his will that you be born anew by means of waters which were for the first created and that means after the shemaim and the earth it was the waters they were created before anything else was for he for who is regenerated by water, sorry, for he who is regenerated by water, having filled up the measure of good works, is made heir of him by whom he has been regenerated in incorruption. So with prepared minds approach as sons to a father, that your sins may be washed away, and it may be proven before Elohim that ignorance was their sole cause. For if after the learning of these things you remain in unbelief, the cause of your destruction will be imputed to yourselves and not to ignorance. And do you suppose that you can have hope towards Elohim or expectation towards Elohim, even if you cultivate all obedience and all righteousness, but do not receive mikvah or immersion? Yea, rather he will be worthy of greater punishment, who does good works not well. For merit occurs to men from tobe works or good works, but only if they be done as Elohim commands. And that's just like it says in the Psalms, if Yahuwah does not build the house, its laborers have labored in vain. If we build anything else on this, it's gonna be burned up when the fire comes to prove the works, right? This is what he's alluding to. Now Elohim has ordered everyone who worships him to be sealed by immersion. <clears throat> but if you refuse and obey your own will rather than Yahuwah's, you are doubtless contrary and hostile to his will. But maybe you will say, what does the immersion in water contribute towards the worship of Elohim? In the first place, because that which has pleased Elohim is fulfilled. In the second place, <clears throat> because when you are regenerated and born again of water and of Elohim, the frailty of your former birth, which you have through men, is cut off. And so at length you will be able to obtain deliverance. But otherwise it is impossible. For thus has the foreteller of truth testified or protested, witnessed to us with an oath. Amen, I say to you, that unless a man is born again of water and of the Ruach, he will not enter into the Malkuth Shemaim. <clears throat> and this is specifically alluding to the millennial reign, because you can still be in the forever after after the great white throne judgment. But the Malkuth Shamaim is the millennial reign. It's, it's the first resurrection. That's what he's talking about. Therefore, make haste that there, for, sorry, therefore make haste for there is in these waters a certain power of mercy or chesed, loving kindness, that was born upon them at the beginning and acknowledges those who are immersed under the name of the master Yahushua and rescues them from future punishments, presenting them as a gift to Elohim, the Ruach Oath, or rather the inner beings that are set apart by immersion. Commit yourselves therefore to these waters, for they alone can quench the violence of future or of the future fire. <clears throat> and he who delays to approach to them, it is evident that the idol of unbelief remains in him. And by it, he is prevented from hastening to the waters that confer deliverance. 
for whether you be righteous or unrighteous, immersion is necessary for you in every respect. For the righteous that perfection may be accomplished in him, and he may be born again to Elohim. For the unrighteous, that pardon may be guaranteed him for the sins that he has committed in ignorance. Therefore, all should hasten to be born again to Elohim without delay, because the end of everyone's life is uncertain. Yet, when you have been regenerated by the waters of the mikvah or immersion, you must show by tob or good works the likeness in you of that father who has begotten you. Now that you know Yahuwah, honor him as a father, and his honor is that you live according to his will. And his will is that you so live as to know nothing of murder or adultery. And if you remember, these are not only physical acts, but the thoughts of your heart. To flee from hatred and covetedness to put away anger, pride, and boasting, to abhor envy, and to count all such things entirely unsuitable to you. There is truly a certain peculiar observance of our way of life, which is not so much imposed upon men as it is sought out by every worshiper of Elohim by reason of its purity. By reason of chastity, I say, of which there are many kinds, but first, that everyone be careful that he come not near a menstruous woman. For this the Torah of Elohim regards as detestable. But though the Torah had given no admonition concerning these things, should we willingly, like beetles, roll ourselves in filth? For we ought to have something more than animals, as reasonable men and capable of Shemayim senses, whose chief study it ought to be to guard the conscience from every defilement of the heart. <clears throat> Moreover, it is, go it is good, Tob, and tends to purity also, <clears throat> to wash the body with water. I call it Tob, or good, not as if it were that prime good of the purifying of the mind, but because this of the washing of the body is the sequel of that toe. For so also our master rebuked some of the Pharisees or Purushim and Sophrim or scribes who seemed to be better than others, separated from the people calling them hypocrites because they purified only those things that were seen of men, but left defiled and sordid their hearts, which Yahuwah alone sees. To some therefore of them, not to all, he said, woe to you, Sophrim and Purushim, or scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye cleanse the outside of the cup and platter, but the inside is full of pollution. Blind Pharisee, First make clean what is within, and what is without will be clean also. For truly, if the mind be purified by the light of knowledge, when once it is clean and clear, then it necessarily takes care of that which is on the outside of a man, that is his flesh, that it also may be purified. But when that which is on the outside the cleansing of the flesh is neglected. It is certain that there is no care taken of the purity of the mind and the cleanliness or the cleanness of the heart. Thus, therefore, it comes to pass that he who is clean inwardly is without doubt cleansed outwardly also. But not always that he who is clean outwardly is also cleaned inwardly. To wit, when he does those things only that may please men. And if you remember, <clears throat> there's two things that have come up recently or I've shared with you. In the third commandment on Exodus 20, if you actually look at the Hebrew and then you look into what those words mean, it says you will not lift up 
his name to schwa, right? Vanity, a lie, falsehood, ruin, not. For Yahuwah will not purify the one who lifts up his name to schwa. So that purifying is the importance of not, not bringing his name to a lie or not lifting up his, his character to a falsehood or his name to a lie, literally, in every aspect of what that can mean. That's what it does mean, because he's not partial. He's the truth. But the other important one there was in, I believe it's chapter one of the book of Gad the Seer, with the foretelling of the coming of our Mashiach, what he was going to suffer, the woes that would happen in his return and esteem. <clears throat> it's mentioned, the father speaking to him, that the pure have a place with him and not the impure. And it's because he's allowed the mixture of them and within his body that these things have happened to him. So it's a very, he, at the end of time, it mentions in that thing, he's going to bring the pure that have been mixed with the unpures an offering to his father. But not, it, it's because the pure have a place with him, but not the impure. Something we all want to keep in mind. And that's directly related to what he's talking about here. All right, so to continue. <clears throat> it says, but there is further reason why chastity should be observed by those who hold. Oh, I'm sorry, let me start over. But this kind of chastity is also to be observed. That sexual intercourse must not take place heedlessly. And for the sake of mere pleasure, but for the sake of begetting children. And since this observance is found even amongst some of the lower animals, it would be a shame if it be not observed by men, reasonable and worshiping Yahuwah. But there is this further reason why chastity should be observed by those who hold the trite worship of Elohim, in whose or in those forms of it, of which we have spoken, and others of like sort, that it is observed strictly even amongst those who are still held by the devil in error. For even amongst them, there is in some degree the observance of chastity. What then will you not observe now that you are reformed, what you observed when you were in error? Yet maybe some one of you will say, must we then observe all things that we did while we worshipped idols? Not all, but whatever things were done well, these you ought to observe even now. Because if anything is rightly done by those who are in error, it is certain that that is derived from the truth. Whereas if anything is not rightly done in the true obedience, that is without doubt borrowed from error for good is good though it be done by those who are in error and evil is evil though it be done by those who follow the truth or will we be so foolish that if we see a worshiper of idols to be sober we will refuse to be sober least we should seem to do the same things as he does who worships idols <clears throat> it is not so but let this be our study, that if those who err do not commit murder, we should not even <clears throat> be angry. If they do not commit adultery, we should not even covet another's wife. If they love their neighbors, we should love even our enemies. If they lend, lend to those who have means of pain, we should give to those from whom we do not hope to receive anything. And in all things, we who expect for the inheritance of the ageless world ought to excel those who know only the present world, knowing that if their works, when compared with our works, be found like and equal in the day of judgment, there will be confusion to us because we are found equal in our works to those who are condemned on account of ignorance and had no expectation of the world to come. And truly, confusion is our worthy portion, 
if we have done no more than those who are inferior to us in knowledge. But if it be confusion to us to be found merely equal to them in works, what will become of us if the examination that is to take place find us inferior and worse than they are? Hear therefore how our foreteller of truth has taught us concerning these things. For with respect to those who neglect to hear the words of Hokma or wisdom, he speaks thus. The queen of the south will rise in judgment with this generation and will condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the hokma of Shalomo. And behold, the greater than Shalomo is here, and they hear him not. Yet with respect to those who refuse to repent of their evil deeds, he spoke thus. The men of Nineveh will rise in the judgment with this generation and will condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Yonah, and behold, a greater than Yonah is here. I want to point out something. If you read that carefully, it says, the men of Nineveh will rise in the judgment with this generation. Meaning that generation was not going to be delivered. He was telling them straight to their face. They're, they're done because of what they're choosing to do. <clears throat> they had full knowledge of his coming. They had the word to expect him. And when he came, they, they killed him. So he's telling them to their face, the, the queen of Sheba and the men of Nineveh would rise in the, in, the gener, in the judgment and condemn them for the things that they're doing because they repented or they did elsewise when they were alive. It says, you see, therefore, how he condemned those who were instructed out of the Torah by adducing the example of those who came from Goyim ignorance or the ignorance of the nations and showing that the former were not even equal to those who seemed to live in error. From all these things, then, the statement that he propounded is proven. The chastity which is observed to a certain extent, even by those who live in error, should be held much more purely and strictly in all its forms, as we have already shown, by us who follow the truth, and rather because with us ageless rewards are assigned to its observance. When he had said these things and others to the same effect, he dismissed the crowds, and having, according to his custom, supped with his Chavarim, or friends, <clears throat> he went to sleep. And while in this manner he was teaching the word of Yahuwah for three whole months and converting multitudes to the belief, at last he ordered me to fast. And after the fast, he conferred on me the immersion of ever flowing water in the fountains adjoining the sea. And when for the favor of regeneration, Elohim conferred upon me. We had joyfully kept a celebration or festival with our brothers, which was quite possibly the 15th of the third month. Or it could have been, if they were doing it after that, it, would have been, it could have been the first of the fourth month, but it would have been the, the Chodesh or one of the, the festival days. It says, Kepha ordered those who had been appointed to go before him to proceed to Antioch and there to wait three months. And they having gone, he himself led down to the fountains, which I have said are near the sea, <clears throat> those who had fully received the belief of Yahuwah and immersed them and celebrating the. Okay, now you see it was the wrong time he was going in the, the winter season there. And then this was leading into spring. This is and celebrating the Passover or Pesach with them. He appointed as Maverick Cree or overseer over them, Maro, who had entertained him in his house and who was now perfect in all things. 
And with him, he appointed 12 Zachanim, or elders, and attendants at the same time. He also, it, and now it doesn't go into detail here, but Kepha's appointing these men, and it's all by unanimous consent that they're chosen from the body of the people and approved. If it, there is not unanimous consent, then they're not approved. But everyone was in full agreement with what he was choosing and doing. And that's why you're meant to listen to the elders and overseers because you willingly chose them to be over you in the body. Just like they did all through history, consent of the governed. It's what our country was established on. He also instituted the order of widows and arranged all the services of the kahal or congregation and charged them all to obey Maro, their overseer, in all things that he should command them. And all these instructions are in detail in the Apostolic Constitutions, just so you know. And thus, all things being suitably arranged, when the three months were fulfilled, we bade farewell to those who were at Tripoli's and set out for Antioch. All right, and then uh, we'll pause for a moment for questions or comments, and we'll continue on the next book, if you so please. Shalom, everyone. So we're continuing on. This is the next book, and I was off. I'm sorry. We're on book seven now. Kepha is continuing his journey from Tripoli to Antioch. It says, at length, leaving Tripoli's, the city of Phoenicia, we made our first halt at Ortosius, not far from Tripoli's, <clears throat> and there we remained the next day also, because almost all those that had believed in the master Yahushua, unable to part from Kepha, followed him thus far. From there we came to Antheratus, but because there were many in our company, Kepha said to Nisita and Aquila, as there are immense crowds of brothers with us, and we bring upon ourselves no little envy as we enter into every city, it seems to me that we must take means without doing so unpleasing a thing as to prevent their following us, to secure that the immoral one will not stir up envy against us on account of any display. I desire, therefore, that you, Nisita, and Aquila would go before us with them so that you may lead the multitude divided into two sections, that we may enter every city of the nations traveling apart rather than in one assemblage. And who knows what that's alluding to from the patriarch's time? I'll just tell you if you don't know. Remember the three patriarchs, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov were like the three ages. The pre-migration, the sojourning before they entered in the land was like Abraham's time leading up to their going into Mitzrayim and coming out again and going through the wilderness. And then Yitzhak was the promised seed who would always dwelt in the land. And then Yaakov, was the one who went out of the land to go labor for his family and to return. And so you see a parallel that when Yaakov was coming back into the land, he, with his possessions and family, he broke them up into group to go before his brother, right? So that there wouldn't be uh, envy, as you see. And Kepha, knowing these things, is doing the same thing so that for the same circumstances but it's in a larger scale picture and it's actually going out to build the assembly instead of coming in with it. But to continue on, it says, yet I know that you think it's sad to be separated from me for the space of at least two days. Believe me that in whatever degree you love me, my word to you is tenfold greater. 
But if by reason of our mutual affection, we will not do the things that are right and honorable, such love will appear to be unreasonable. And therefore, without reducing in the least our love, let us attend to those things that seem useful and necessary, especially since not a day can pass in which you may not be present at my discussions. For I propose to pass through the most noted cities of the provinces one by one, as you also know, and to reside three months in each for the sake of teaching. Now, therefore, go before me to Laodicea, which is the nearest city, and I will follow you after two or three days, so far as I propose but you will wait for me at the inn nearest to the gate of the city. And from there again, when we have spent a few days there, you will go before me to more distant cities. And this I desire you to do at every city for the sake of avoiding envy, as much as in us lies. And also that the brothers who are with us finding lodgings prepared in the several cities by your foresight may not seem to be vagabonds. And if you are familiar, that is spoken in a very negative light in Ecclesiasticus or Sirach ben Yahushua. When Kepha thus spoke, they of course acquiesced, saying, it does not greatly sadden us to do this because we are ordered by you who have been chosen by the foresight of Mashiach to do and to counsel well in all things. But also because while it is a heavy loss not to see our master Kepha for one, or it may be two days, yet it is not intolerable. And we think of our 12 brothers who go before us and who are deprived of the advantage of hearing and seeing you for a whole month out of the three that you stay in every city. Therefore, we will not delay doing as you order, because you order all things aright. And thus, saying they went forward, having received instructions that they should speak to the brothers who journeyed with them outside the city, and request them not to enter the cities in a crowd and with tumult, but apart and divided. But when they were gone, I, Clement, rejoiced greatly because he had kept me with himself. And I said to him, I give thanks to Elohim that you have not sent me forward with the others, for I should have died through sadness. Then said Kepha, and what will the result be if necessity will demand that you be spent or be sent anywhere for the purpose of teaching? Would you die if you were separated from me for a good purpose? Would you not put a restraint upon yourself to bear patiently what necessity is laid upon you? Or do you not know that friends are always together and are joined in memory, though they be separated bodily? As on the other hand, some persons are near to one another in body, but are separate in mind. <clears throat> and this is what he means by being of one mind, having the same disposition, purpose, and will. Right? Then I answered, think not, my master, that I suffer these things unreasonably. But there is a certain cause and reason for this affection of mine towards you. For I have you alone as the object of all my affections instead of father and mother and brothers. But above all this is the fact that you alone are the cause of my deliverance and knowledge of the truth. And also this I do not count of least moment that my youthful age is subject to the snares of lusts. He's, um, he's 32 at the current when he's speaking this, I believe. You'll find that out later. And I am afraid to be without you, by whose sole presence all effemacy, however irrational it be, is put to shame. Although I trust by the mercy of Elohim that even my mind, from what it has conceived through your instruction, will be 
unable to receive aught else into its thoughts. Besides, I remember your saying at Caesarea, if anyone desires to accompany me without violating dutifulness, let him accompany me. And by this you meant that he should not take anyone or make anyone sad, to whom he ought, according to Yahuwah's appointment, to cleave. For example, that he should not leave a trustworthy wife or parents or the like. Now from these, I am entirely free, and so I am fit for following you. And I desire you would grant me that I might perform to you the service of a servant. Then Kepha laughing said, and do you not think, Clement, that very necessity must make you my servant? For who else can spread my sheets and arrange my beautiful coverlets? Who will be at hand to keep my rings and prepare my robes, which I must be constantly changing? Who will superintend my cooks and provide various and choice meats to be prepared by most complicated and various arts, and all those things that are procured at enormous expense and are brought together for men of delicate upbringing? Yea, rather, for their appetite, as for some enormous beast. But maybe, although you live with me, you do not know my manner of life. I live on bread alone with olives and seldom even with pot herbs. And my dress is what you see, a tunic with salt or with a tallet, sorry, which they, it's a prayer shawl is what they call that. But um, the renewed covenant writings in the Greek, they call it a paladin. And it's just like an overcloak or a coat. And having these, I require nothing more. This is sufficient for me because my mind does not regard things present, but things ageless. And therefore, no present and visible thing delights me. Whence I embrace and admire your good mind towards me. And I commend you the more because though you have been accustomed to so great abundance, you have been able so soon to abandon it and to accommodate yourself to this life of ours, which makes use of necessary things alone. For we, that is, I and my brother, and Dari, or says Adam Yaw, have grown up from our childhood, not only orphans, but also extremely poor. And through necessity, we have become used to labor, whence now also we easily bear the fatigues of our journeyings. But rather, if you would consent and allow it, I, who am a working man, could more easily discharge the duty of a servant to you. But I trembled when I heard this, and my eyes, or sorry, and my tears immediately gushed forth. Because so great a man who is worth more than the whole world had addressed such a proposal to me. Then he, when he saw me weeping, inquired the reason. And I answered him, how have I so sinned against you that you should distress me with such a proposal? Then Kepha, if it is evil that I said I should serve you, you were first in fault in saying the same thing to me. Then said I, the cases are not alike, for it becomes me to do this to you, but it is grievous that you who are sent as the herald of Yahuwah El Shaddai to save the inner beings of men should say this to me, or should say it to me. Then said Kepha, I should agree with you were it not that our master Yahushua, who came for the deliverance of the whole world, and who was nobler than any of his creation, submitted to be a servant, that he might persuade us not to be ashamed to perform the ministry of servants to our brothers. Then said I, it were foolishness in me to suppose that I can prevail with you. Nevertheless, I give thanks to the providence of Elohim, because I have merited to have you instead of parents. 
Then said Kepha, is there then no one of your family surviving? I answered, there are indeed many powerful men coming of the stock of Caesar or Caesar. And if you weren't familiar, the line of Caesar, the family of Julius Caesar came from the Julian or Julius tribe of the families of Rome. And that tribe is the leading tribe. It was the original tribe of the monarchs of the of the Roman nation. And they were the sons of Yahuda from the line of Zara that had migrated from Greece at the fall of Troy that were paganized. The ones that stayed righteous went to Crete then went to Gaul, and then went to what we call Scotland or Caledonia. But there was a few that after the fall of Troy that were paganized and scattered, and there were some that were made slaves, both the original founders of Britain and the um, founders of Rome or the Latinum Federation all came from that, the waves of Trojans that had left them and were still alive. You can find information about them also in the book of Tay Taffy, which is the Irish bard songs about the daughter of Zadik Yahu coming from the land of Yahuda, being taken by Yermi Yahu to Ireland, where she married the largest landholder there and founded the kingdom for the reign of Ulster. But to continue here, it says, for Caesar himself gave a wife to my father as being his relative and educated along with him and of a suitable noble family. By her, my father had twin sons born before me, not very like one another, as my father told me, for I never knew them. But indeed, I have not a distinct recollection even of my mother, but I cherish the remembrance of her face as if I had seen it in a dream. My mother's name was Methidia, my father's Festinius, my brother's Festinus and Festus. Now, when I was barely five years old, my mother saw a vision so I learned from my father, by which she was warned that unless she speedily fled the city with her twin sons and was absent for 10 years, she and her children should perish by a miserable fate. Then my father, who tenderly loved his sons, put them on board a ship with their mother and sent them to Athens to be educated with slaves and maid servants and a sufficient supply of money, retaining me only to be a comfort to him and thankful for this, that the vision had not commanded me also to go with my mother. And at the end of the year, my father sent men to Athens with money for them, desiring also to know how they did. But those who were sent never returned. Again in the third year, my sorrowful father sent other men with money who returned in the fourth year and related that they had seen neither my mother nor my brothers, that they had never reached Athens and that no trace had been found of any one of those who had been with them. My father hearing this and confounded with excess sorrow, not knowing whither to go or where that to seek, went down with me to the harbor and began to ask of the sailors whether any of them had seen or heard of the bodies of a mother and two little children being cast ashore anywhere four years ago. At that time, no one or one told one story and another but nothing definite was disclosed to us searching in this boundless sea. Yet my father, by reason of the great affection that he bore to his wife and children, was fed with vain hopes until he thought of placing me under guardians and leaving me at Rome, as I was now 12 years old, and himself going in quest of them. 
Therefore he went down to the harbor weeping and going on board a ship, took his departure, and from that time till now I have never received any letters from him, nor do I know whether he is alive or dead. But I rather suspect that he also has perished, either through a broken heart or by shipwreck. For twenty years have now elapsed since then, and no tidings of him have ever reached me. So he was twelve when his father left, and it's been twenty years. That's why I mentioned he's thirty-two. I want you to pay careful attention. He's giving his reason why he can't be separated from Kepha. And so our creator, who has the power of all things, will affect the change to make all of these reasons not exist so that he can do his will without any hesitation. So that was his kindness to Clement. That's why this is named the Recognitions, by the way. But one more thing I want you to pay careful attention to is that at this point in time, they were all of the nations, not believers in the truth. And they were all involved with idolatry in some fashion in their life not Clement specifically, but his parents were. And they mentioned that later on in the books here. But it's because of that, they're having given demons jurisdiction over them, that they were both enticed to more licitious behavior. She was being persuaded to sin through adultery. But when she refused to do so, bad things happen. She separated from her family. There's a whole bunch of chaos, but they're not killed. Their lives were preserved because they were chaste. They were in their hearts decent. And so they were preserved for the evil that they were doing. And this is something that happened until the deliverance came through the word being brought to them, as you'll see as we go. But I wanted to point that out because this very thing is the reason why stuff happens. If you don't do overt evil and go more and more into it, those are the ones that are suffering. Uh, affliction in this life and it's twofold it's to get us to repent and it's also because we're we're doing you know we're making ourselves available for it but it says differing effects on suffering on heathens and believers kepha hearing this shed tears of sympathy and said to his friends who were present if any man who is a worshiper of Elohim had endured what this man's father has endured, immediately men would assign his belief as the cause of his calamities. Thinking of like Job, right? But when these things come upon miserable nations or goyim, they charge their misfortunes upon fate. I call them miserable because they are both vexed with errors here and are deprived of future expectation. Whereas when the worshipers of Yahuwah suffer these things, their patient endurance of them contributes to their cleansing from sin. After this, one of those present began to ask Kepha that early next day we should go to a neighboring island called Ardas which was not more than six furlongs, three-fourths of a mile off, to see a certain wonderful work that was in it, namely, vinewood columns of immense size. To this Kepha assented, as he was very kind, but he charged us that we, or sorry, that when we left the ship, we should not rush all together to see it. For, said he, I do not desire you to be noticed by the crowd. When, therefore, next day we reached the island by ship in the course of an hour, forthwith we hastened to the place where the wonderful columns were. They were placed in a certain hekel or temple, in which there were very magnificent works of Phidias, on which every one of us gazed earnestly. But when Kepha had admired only the columns, being in no wise ravished with the favor of the painting, he went out and saw before the gates a poor woman asking alms of those who went in. And looking earnestly at her, he said, Tell me, O woman, 
what member of your body is wanting that you subject yourself to the indignity of asking alms and do not rather gain your bread by laboring with your hands that Elohim has given you. But she sighing said, would that I had hands that could be moved, but now only the appearance of hands has been preserved. For they are lifeless and have been rendered feeble and without feeling by my knowing of them. Then Kepha said, What has been the cause of your inflicting so great an injury upon yourself? Want of courage, she said, and nothing else. For if I had had any bravery in me, I could either have thrown myself from a precipice or cast myself into the depths of the sea, and so ended my grievances. My grievances. This is grieves. But that doesn't make sense. Ben Kepha said, Do you think, O woman, that those who destroy themselves are set free from torments, and not rather that the inner beings of those who lay violent hands upon themselves are subjected to greater punishments? Then said she, I wish I were sure that inner beings live in the infernal regions. For I would gladly embrace the suffering of the penalty of suicide, only that I might see my darling children, if it were but for an hour. Then Kepha, what thing is so great that affects you with so heavy sadness? I should like to know, for if you informed me of the cause, I might be able both to show you clearly, O woman, that inner beings do live in the infernal regions, and instead of the precipice or the deep sea, I might give you some remedy that you may be able to end your life without torment. Then the woman hearing this welcome promise began to say, <clears throat> it is neither easy of belief nor do I think it necessary to tell what is my extraction or what is my country. It is enough only to explain the cause of my grief why I have rendered my hands powerless by gnawing them. Being born of noble parents and having become the wife of a suitably powerful man, I had twin sons and after them one other. But my husband's brother was vehemently inflamed with illegitimate love towards me. And as I valued chastity above all things and would neither consent to so great immorality nor desired to disclose to my husband the baseness of his brother, I considered whether in any way I could escape unpolluted and yet not set brother against brother. And that kind of behavior is reminiscent to how Yahusuf was. If you ever read the Testament of Yahusuf, he suffered all the afflictions that he did. He went into persecution. Uh, he went into slavery and was persecuted. He would not admit that he was the son of Yaakov and that his brother sold him into slavery because he didn't want to get them in trouble. But it says, and so bring the whole race of a noble family into dishonor. I made up my mind, therefore, to leave my country with my twins until the incestuous lust should subside, which the sight of me was fostering and inflaming. And I thought that our other son should remain to comfort his father to some extent. Now, in order to carry out this plan, I pretended that I had had a dream in which some false mighty one stood by me in a vision and told me that I should immediately depart from the city with my twins and should be absent until he should command me to return. And that if I did not do so, I should perish with all my children. And so it was done, for as soon as I told the dream to my husband, he was terrified, and sending me with my twin sons, and also slaves and maidservants, and giving me plenty of money, he ordered me to sail to Athens, where I might educate my sons, and that I should stay there until he who commanded me to depart should give me leave to return. While I was sailing along with my sons, I was shipwrecked in the night by the violence of the winds, 
and wretch that I am, was driven to this place. And when all had perished, a powerful wave caught me and cast me upon a rock. And while I sat there with only this expectation or hope that I might be able to find my sons, I did not throw myself into the deep, although then my inner being, disturbed and drunk with grief, had both the courage and the power to do it. But then the day dawned, and I, with shouting and howling, was looking around if I could even see the corpses of my woeful sons anywhere washed ashore. Some of those who saw me were moved with compassion and searched, first over the sea, and then also along the shores, if they could find either of my children. But when neither of them was anywhere found, the women of the place taking pity on me began to comfort me, everyone telling her own grievances, that I might take consolation from the likeness of their calamities to my own. But this saddened me all the more, for my disposition was not such that I could regard the misfortunes of others as comforts to me. And when many desire to receive me hospitably, a certain poor woman who dwells here constrained me to enter into her hut, saying that she had had a husband who was a sailor, and that he had died at sea while a young man, and that although many afterwards asked her in marriage, she preferred widowhood through love of her husband. Therefore, she said, we will share whatever we can gain by labor of our hands. And not to detain you with a long and profitless story, I willingly dwelt with her on account of that faithful affection that she retained for her husband. But not long after my hands, melancholy woman that I was, long torn with nine, became powerless. And she who had taken me in fell into palsy and now lies at home in her bed. Also, the affection of those women who had formerly pitied, pitied me grew cold. We are both helpless. I, as you see, sit begging. And when I get anything, one meal serves two wretches. Behold, now you have heard enough of my affairs. Why do you delay the fulfillment of your promise to give me a remedy by which both of us may end our miserable life without torment? While she was speaking, <clears throat> Kepha, being distracted with much thought, stood like one thunderstruck. And I, Clement, coming up, said, I have been seeking you everywhere. And now what are we to do? But he commanded me to go before him to the ship and there to wait for him. And because he must not be opposed, I did as he commanded me. But he, as he afterwards told me the whole, being struck with a sort of suspicion, asked of the woman her family and her country and the names of her sons. And straight away he said, if you tell me these things, I will give you the remedy. But she, like one suffering violence, because she would not confess these things, and yet was desirous of the remedy, feigned one thing after another, saying that she was an Ephesian and her husband a Sicilian, and giving false names to her sons. Then Kepha, supposing that she had answered, truly said, alas, O woman, I thought that some great joy should spring up to us today. For I suspected that you were a certain woman concerning whom I lately learned certain like things. But she adjured him, saying, I entreat you to tell me what they are, that I may know if amongst women there be one more accursed than myself. Then Kepha, incapable of deception and moved with compassion, began to say, there is a certain young man among those who follow me for the sake of belief and obedience, a Roman citizen who told me that he had a father and twin brothers of whom not one is left to him. <clears throat> my mother, he said, as I learned from my father, saw a vision that she should depart from the Roman city for a time with her twin sons, else they should perish by a dreadful death. 
and when she had departed, she was never more seen. And afterwards, his father set out to search for his wife and sons and was also lost. When Kepha had thus spoken, <clears throat> the woman, struck with astonishment, fainted. Then Kepha began to hold her up and to comfort her and to ask what the matter was or what she suffered. But she at length, with difficulty recovering her breath and nerving herself up to the greatness of the joy that she hoped for, and at the same time wiping her face, said, Is he here, the youth of whom you speak? But Kepha, when he comprehended the matter, said, Tell me first, or else you will not see him. <clears throat> and she said, I am the mother of the youth. Then says Kepha, what is his name? And she answered, Clement. Then said Kepha, it is himself, and he it was that spoke with me a little while ago, whom, and whom I ordered to go before me to the ship. Then she fell down at Kepha's feet and began to entreat him that he would hasten to the ship. Then Kepha said, yes, if you will promise me that you will do as I say. Then she said, I will do anything. Only show me my only son. For I think that in him I will see my twins also. Then Kepha said, when you have seen him, remain apart for a little time until we, have, until we leave the island. I will do so, she said. Then Kepha, holding her hand, led her to the ship, and when I saw him giving his hand to the woman, I began to laugh. Yet, approaching to do him honor, I tried to substitute my hand for his and to support the woman. <clears throat> but as soon as I touched her hand, she uttered a loud scream and rushed into my embrace and began to devour me with a mother's kisses. But I, being ignorant of the whole matter, pushed her off as a madwoman. And at the same time, though with reverence, I was somewhat angry with Kepha. But he said, cease, what are you doing, Clement, my son? Do you not push away your mother? But as soon as I heard these words, immediately bathed in tears, fell upon my mother who had fallen down and began to kiss her. For as soon as I heard, by degrees, I recalled her countenance to my memory. And the longer I gazed, the more familiar it grew to me. Meantime, a great multitude assembled, hearing that the woman who used to sit and beg was recognized by her son, <clears throat> who was a good man. And when we desired to sail hastily away from the island, my mother said to me, my darling son, it is right that I should bid farewell to the woman who took me in, for she is poor and paralytic and bedridden. And when Kepha and all who were present heard this, they admired the goodness and prudence of the woman. And immediately Kepha ordered some to go and to bring the woman in her bed as she lay. And when she had been brought, and placed in the midst of the crowd, Kepha said in the presence of all, if I am a preacher of truth for confirming the belief of all those who stand by, that they may know and believe that there is one Elohim who made the sky and earth. In the name of Yahushua the Mashiach, his son, let this woman arise or rise. And as soon as he had said this, she arose whole and fell down at Kepha's feet, and greeting her friend and acquaintance with kisses, asked of her what was the meaning of it all. But she shortly related to her the whole proceeding of the recognition, and so the crowd standing around wondered. Just one moment. All right, so continuing on, this is the departure from Aradus. It says, then Kepha, so far as he could, and as time permitted, 
addressed the crowds on the belief of Elohim and the commandments of Torah, and then added that if anyone desired to know more accurately about these things, he should come to Antioch. Where, said he, we have resolved to stay three months and to teach fully the things that pertain to deliverance. For if, said he, men leave their country and their parents for commercial or military purposes and do not fear to undertake long voyages, why should it be thought burdensome or difficult to leave home for three months for the sake of ageless life? When he had said these things and much more, sorry, and more to the same purpose, I presented a thousand drachmas to the woman who, one drachma, by the way, I don't know what it would be equivalent to for today's standard, but I was just reading earlier this, earlier this Shabbat in the first book of the Maccabees. And in a footnote, it mentioned that a drachma, a Hebrew drachma was about 51 pounds sterling for the British back in the 1800s. Whatever that might be today, I'd have to look. <clears throat> sterling silver? Yes, 51 pounds sterling is sterling silver. And the British pound is the like a their measurement of money, a, do, a monetary value, like a denarius or a dollar. Okay. It says, I presented a thousand drachmas to the woman who had been so hospitable to my mother and who had recovered her health by means of kepha. And in the presence of all committed her to the charge of a certain good man, the chief person in that town who promised that he would gladly do what we requested of him. I also distributed a little money among some others and among those women who were said formerly to have comforted my mother in her miseries, to whom I also expressed my thanks. And after this, we sailed along with my mother to Atherardus or Antherardus. And when we had come to our lodging, my mother began to ask of me what had become of my father. And I told her that he had gone to seek her and never returned. But she, hearing this, only sighed, for her great joy on my account lightened her other sorrows. And the next day she journeyed with us, sitting with Kepha's wife, and we came to Belenie. Er, where we stayed three days and then went on to Pathos and afterwards to Gabala. And so we arrived at Laodicea where Nasita and Aquila met us before the gates and kissing us conducted us to a lodging. But Kepha seeing that it was a large and splendid city said that it was worthy that we should stay in it 10 days or even longer. Then Nasita and Aquila asked of me who this unknown or who was this unknown woman? And I answered, it is my mother whom Yahuwah has given back to me by means of Kepha. And you see right here, it says rabbi. I, I don't know why they would have that title there. If this was an honest writing from Kepha or from Clement, he wouldn't be calling any man rabbi because Kepha would, would correct that. So I know that this was the particular translation from a messianic believer and that tried to get rid of the churchianic language, if you will. But I'm not certain that we should ever call any man rabbi. It doesn't matter if it's Kepha or whoever. Only Yahuwah, Yahushua, Mashiach is our rabbi or our teacher. But it says, and when I had said this, Kepha began to relate the whole matter to them in order and said, when we had come to Aradis and I had ordered you to go on before us, the same day after you had gone, Clement was led in the course of conversation to tell me of his extraction and his family and how he had been deprived of his parents 
and had had twin brothers older than himself, and that, as his father told him, his mother once saw a vision by which she was ordered to depart from the city of Rome with her twin sons, else she and they should suddenly perish. And when she had told his father the dream, he loving his sons with tender affection and afraid of any evil befalling them, put his wife and sons on board a ship with all necessaries and sent them to Athens to be educated. Afterwards, he sent once and again persons to inquire after them, but nowhere even a trace or but nowhere found even a trace of them. At last, the father himself went on the search, and until now he is nowhere to be found. When Clement had given me this narrative, there came one to us asking us to go to the neighboring island of Aradus to see vinewood columns of wonderful size. I consented, and when we came to the place, all the rest went into the interior of the temple. But I, for what reason I know not, had no mind to go farther. But while I was waiting outside for them, I began to notice this woman and to wonder in what part of her body she was disabled and that she did not seek her living by the labor of her hands, but submitted to the shame of beggary. I therefore asked of her the reason of it. She confessed that she was sprung of a noble race and was married to no less noble husband. Whose brother, she said, or said she, being inflamed by illegitimate love towards me, desired to defile his brother's bed. This I abhorred and yet dared not to tell my husband of so great immorality. Least I should stir up war between brothers and bring dishonor upon the family and judged it better to depart from my country with my twin sons, leaving the younger boy to be a comfort to his father. And that this might be done with an honorable appearance, I thought good to feign a dream and to tell my husband that there stood by me in a vision, a certain deity who told me to set out from the city immediately with my twins and remain until he should instruct me to return. She told me that her husband, when he heard this, believed her and sent her to Athens with the twin children to be educated there. And I don't know if I've mentioned it to you before, but the word Athens comes from Athan, just like Athena is the female version of it. But Athen is the Chaldaic or the Chasdeems or the Chasdeem from Babylon. It's their dialects version of the word Adon or master. So Athens is the, the master city, if you will. With the twin children, oh, in Athena, by the way, it means my lady. It's, it's my lady worship, it's the queen of heaven worship still. That's what that's all about, by the way. Is that with the twin children to be educated there, but that they were driven by a terrible tempest upon that island where when the ship had gone to pieces, she was lifted by a wave upon a rock and delayed killing herself only for this until, said she, I could embrace at least the dead limbs of my unfortunate sons and commit them to burial. But when the day dawned and crowds had assembled, they took pity upon me and threw a garment over me. But I, miserable, entreated them with many tears to search if they could find anywhere the bodies of my fallen sons. And I, tearing all my body with my teeth and welling and howling, cried out constantly, wretched woman that I am, where is my Fastus? Where is, or where my Fastinius? And when Kepha said this, Nasita and Aquila suddenly started up and being astonished, began to be greatly agitated saying, Yahuwah, you ruler and Elohim of all, 
are these things true or are we in a dream? Then Kepha said, unless we be mad, these things are true. But they, after a short pause and wiping their faces, said, we are Fastinius and Fastus, or Faustus. And even at the first, when you began this narrative, we immediately fell into a suspicion that the matters that you spoke of might truly relate to us. Yet again, considering that many like things occur in men's lives, we kept silence through her, although our hearts were struck by some hope. Therefore, we waited for the end of your story, that if it were entirely obvious that it related to us, we might then confess it. And when they had thus spoken, they went in weeping to their mother. And when they found her asleep, they desired to embrace her. Sorry, and desired to embrace her. Kepha prevented them, saying, permit me first to prepare your mother's mind. Least it be by the great and sudden joy she lose her reason and her comprehension be disturbed, especially as she is now stupefied with sleep. Therefore, when our mother had risen from her sleep, Kepha began to address her, saying, I desire you to know a woman, an observance of our Torah. We worship one Yahuwah who made the world, and we keep his Torah, in which he commands us first of all to worship him and to fear his name or reverence his name to honor our parents and to preserve chastity and uprightness. But this also we observe, not to have a common table with goyim or nations, unless they believe, or sorry, unless when they believe and on the reception of the truth are immersed and set apart by calling on the Baruch name of Yahuwah, Yahushua. And then we eat with them. Otherwise, even if it were a father or a mother, or wife or sons or brothers, we cannot have a common table with them. Since therefore we do this for the special cause of obedience, let it not seem hard to you that your son cannot eat with you until you have the same judgment of the belief that he has. Then she, when she heard this, said, And what hinders me to be immersed today? For even before I saw you, I was wholly alienated from those whom you call Elohim, because they were not able to do anything for me, although I frequently and almost daily sacrificed to them. And as to chastity, what will I say? When neither in former times did pleasures deceive me, nor afterwards did poverty compel me to sin. But I think you know well enough how great was my love of chastity when I pretended that dream that I might escape the snares of unhallowed love and that I might go abroad with my twins. And when I left this, my son Clement alone to be a comfort to his father. For if two were scarcely enough for me, how much more it would have saddened their father if he had had none at all. For he was wretched through his great affection towards our sons, so that even the authority of the dream could scarcely prevail upon him to give up on me, or to give up to me, Faustinus and Faustus, the brothers of this Clement, and that himself should be content with Clement alone. While she was yet speaking, my brothers could contain themselves no longer, but rushed into their mother's embrace with many tears and kissed her. But she said, what is the meaning of this? Then said Kepha, do not be disturbed, O woman, be firm. These are your sons, Faustinus and Faustus, whom you suppose to have perished in the deep. But how they are alive and how they escaped in that horrible night and how the one of them is called Nesita and the other Aquila, they will be able to explain to you themselves, and we also will hear it along with you. 
When Kepha had said this, our mother fainted, being overcome with excess of joy. And after some time being restored and having come to herself, she said, I beseech you, darling sons, tell me what has befallen you since that dismal and cruel night. Then Nisita began to say, On that night, mother, when the ship was broken up and we were being tossed upon the sea, supported on a fragment of the wreck, certain men whose way was to rob by sea found us and placed us in their boat and overpower, sorry, and overcoming the power of the waves by rowing by various stretches brought us to Caesarea Stratonis. There they starved us, beat us, and terrified us that we might not disclose the truth. And having changed our names, they sold us to a certain widow, a very honorable woman named Yosta. She, having bought us, treated us as sons so that she carefully educated us in Greek literature and liberal arts. And when we grew up, we also attended the philosophic studies that we might be able to confute the nations or goyim by supporting the halakha or walk of Yahuwah's truth by philosophic disputations. And just so you know, the widow that adopted them or that bought them was a Yahudi woman. So she brought them up within Torah observance, right? It says, but we adhered for friendship's sake and boyish, boyish companionship to one Shimon, a magician who was educated along with us so that we were almost deceived by him. For there is mentioned in our teachings of a certain foreteller whose coming we hoped for or was hoped for by all who observed them through whom immortal and joyful life is promised to be given to those who believe in him. Now we thought that this Shimon was he, but these things will be explained to you, O oh mother, at a more convenient season. Meanwhile, when we were almost deceived by Shimon, a certain colleague of our master Kepha, Zakai by name, warned us that we should not be duped by the magician, but presented us to Kepha on his arrival, that by him we might be taught the things that were sound and perfect. And this we expect will be given to you also, even as Yahuwah has granted it to us, that we may be able to eat and have a common table with you. Thus, therefore, it was, O mother, that you believed that we were drowned in the sea while we were stolen by pirates. And if we can, I'd like to finish this last couple because it, it ties in with what we've mentioned, the importance of the fast before immersion, okay? When Nasita had spoken thus, our mother fell down at Kepha's feet, entreating and beseeching him that both herself and her hostess might be immersed without delay. That said she, I may not even for a single day suffer the loss of the company and society of my sons. In like manner, we, her sons, also entreated Kepha. But he said, what? Do you think that I alone am unpitiful and that I do not desire you to enjoy your mother's society at meals? But she must fast at least one day first and so be immersed. And this because I have heard from her a certain declaration by which her belief has been revealed to me and that she that has given evidence of her belief. Otherwise, she must have been instructed and taught many days before she could have been immersed. Then said I, I pray you, my master Kepha, tell us what is that declaration that you say afforded you evidence of her belief. Then Kepha, it is her asking that her hostess, whose loving kindness she desires to requit, may be immersed along with her. 
Now she would not ask that this favor be bestowed upon her whom she loves, unless she believed that there is some great baraka or blessing in immersion. Whence also I find fault with very many who, when they are themselves immersed and believe, yet do nothing worthy of belief with those whom they love, such as wives or children or friends, whom they do not exhort to that which they themselves have obtained, as they would do if indeed they believed that ageless life is thereby bestowed. In short, if they seemed or if they see them to be sick or to be subject to any danger bodily, they grieve and mourn because they are sure that in this destruction threatens them. So then, if they were sure of this, that the punishment of ageless fire awaits, those who do not worship Elohim, why would they cease warning and exhorting? Or if they refused, how would they not mourn and bewail them, being sure that ageless fire, sorry, ageless torments awaited them? Now, therefore, we will send for that woman at once and see if she loves the belief of our beliefs. And as we find, so will we act. But since your mother has judged so trustworthily concerning immersion, let her fast only one day before mikvah. Yet she declared with an oath in the presence of my master Kepha's wife that from the time she recognized her son, she had been unable to take any food from excess of joy, excepting only that yesterday she drank a cup of water. Kepha's wife also bore witness, saying that it was even so. And Aquila said, what then hinders her being immersed? Then Kepha smiling said, but this is not the fast of mikvah, for it was not done in order to obtain mikvah. Then Nasita said, but it may be the Elohim desiring that our mother on our recognition should not be separated even for one day from participation of our table, preordained this fasting. For as in her ignorance, she preserved her chastity, that it might profit her in order to the favor of mikvah or immersion. So she fasted before she knew the reason of fasting, that it might profit her in order to be first. And that immediately from the beginning of our acquaintance, she might enjoy communion or she might enjoy communion of the table with us. Then said Kepha, let not the immoral one prevail against us, taking occasion from a mother's love, but let you and me with you fast this day along with her, and tomorrow she will be immersed, for it is not right that the precepts of truth be relaxed or weakened in favor of any person or friendship. Let us not shrink then from suffering along with her, for it is a sin to transgress any commandment. But let us teach our bodily senses, which are our outer senses, to be in subjection to our inner senses, and not compel our inner senses, meaning our reason, which savor the things that are of Elohim, to follow the outer senses, which savor the things that are of the flesh. For to this end also Yahuwah commanded, saying, Whosoever will look upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. And to this he added, If thy right eye offends thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members perishes rather than thy whole body is cast into Gehenna fire. He does not say has offended thee, that you should then cast away the cause of sin after you have sinned. But if it offend you, that is, that before you sin, you should cut off the cause of the sin that provokes and irritates you. 
But let none of you think, brothers, that Yahuwah recommended the cutting off of the members. His meaning is that the purpose should be, should be cut off, not the members. And the causes that allure to sin in order that our thought, born up on the chariot of sight, may push towards the love of Elohim, supported by the bodily senses, and not give loose reins to the eyes of the flesh as to wanton horses, eager to turn their running outside the way of the commandments, but may subject the bodily sight to the judgment of the mind, and not suffer those eyes of ours which Elohim intended to be viewers and witnesses of his work, to become panders of evil desire. And therefore, let the bodily senses, as well as the internal thought, be subject to Yahuwah's Torah, and let them serve his will, whose work they acknowledge themselves to be. Therefore, as the order and reason of the mystery demanded, on the following day, she was immersed in the sea, and returning to the lodging was initiated in all the mysteries of truth in their order. And we, her sons, Nasita and Aquila, and I, Clement, were present. And after this, we dined with her and esteemed Elohim with, with her, thankfully acknowledging the zeal and teaching of Kepha, who showed us by the example of our mother that the good of chastity is not lost with Elohim. <clears throat> As on the other hand, said he, unchastity does not escape punishment, though it may not be punished immediately, but slowly. Yet so well-pleasing said he, is chastity to Elohim, that it confers some favor in the present life, even upon those who are in error. For future blessedness, or Iraq oath, is laid up for those only who preserve chastity and righteousness by the favor of immersion. In short, that which has befallen your mother is an example of this, for all this welfare has been restored to her in reward for her or of her chastity. For the guarding and preserving of which continuance alone is not sufficient. But when anyone perceives that snares and deceptions are being prepared, he must straightway flee as from the violence of fire or the attack of a mad dog. And that's just like fleeing from Edom when he was angry with him and wanting to kill him, right? And not trust that he can easily frustrate snares of this kind by philosophizing or by humoring them. But, as I have said, he must flee and redraw, withdraw to a distance, as your mother also did through her true and entire love of chastity. And on this account, she had been preserved to you and you to her. And in addition, she has been endowed with the knowledge of ageless life. And when he had said this and much more to the same effect, the evening having come, we went to sleep. And that right there is the end of book seven, which was the introduction and recognition of Clement's mother to Clement and his family, plus a little bit before then, finishing up what we had. So thank you all for your time, and you have a wonderful Shabbat and Shabbat for the week ahead.